Ephesians. I'd like to back up just a little bit to three, talk a little bit about what we had before us last week. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's the focus, that we're in Christ. Who has done that? God has done that. God has placed you in his son. And being in his son and being in union with his son, you're going to experience the blessings that he has received. Think about Adam when he left the garden. What did he leave with? That's a correct, nothing. I always love these questions when you guys don't answer because Adam left the garden with nothing. Some would say, though, Adam left the garden with the ability to choose between good and evil. Isn't that what the devil was promising? I have a hard time with that. I'm like, wait a minute. The devil was saying, hey, God's holding something back from you. Go eat from the tree of good and evil and you'll know these things. It's like we left the garden with nothing. We left the garden cursed. We left the garden in a condition of being judged. We didn't have anything. So the divine initiative, God had to come and put us in Christ. God had to come and put his spirit within us so that we would understand the truth. Is that a praise that we want to give to God this morning? Is that something we want to think about and say, that is praiseworthy. God's grace upon me, that he gave me his spirit, that he opened up my understanding to understand the gospel. Oh, that that will be true of everyone who sits here today, that we understand that, that God did this. God saved a sinner such as myself. But it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. I want to stop there and just talk about that for a second. Remember what we said about blessed. How do we bless God? We bless him by acknowledging him, by saying God did this. Uh, the term here is eulogy. How many of you have gone to a funeral and you heard a eulogy? You've heard the, usually the blessings, right? We never say anything bad till afterwards at the potluck, right? Uh, at least the experiences in my, that I've had. But we go and we hear the eulogy. We hear these blessings of this life that was lived. Hopefully it was a life that was lived for Christ. And Paul is using this term. It's the same term there for blessed in both of these. Now we have to think for a second. There's some heresy that comes out of this that's been taught in some of the churches. Not here locally and I can't pinpoint any of it. But if we're to bless God, if we're to attribute him glory, that's that idea of doxology, right? We sing the doxology. We're to give him credit. We're to praise him. Is he then praising us? Because it says that, doesn't it? It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Does God then sing praises to us? Does God then lift us up? Does God say, wow, look at that. We say, wow, look what God has done. Do we say, you guys say that? You read, your, read the Old Testament, you read through the thing. Wow, look what God did. Look how God showed grace. Look how God showed mercy. Look what God has done. Does God do that with us? He goes, hey, look at those guys. Wow, they did good. Everybody should throw a red flag at this point, Right? That's, that's not what happens. God doesn't praise us because of something we've done, but he puts into us the praise. When Paul says that, blessed, it's the same exact word. It's the same word, but think about this. What is God doing? He's putting into us praises, okay? He's blessing us with an understanding of who he is so that we can bless him. That's the blessing there. Not that God says, ow, look at these guys. These guys are great. That's what we're to do for, towards God, God towards us then generates in us those, that understanding. So it's not, just be careful of that. If you run into somebody out there saying, look, God says that he blesses us, that he sees something of worth in us, and then he is more worthy, he, he is more attributed by our blessing him. Both of those are heresies. But what is he doing? He's putting within us an understanding with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. To underline that, it's gonna come up again and again and again. Paul is saying it's because of your union with Christ and that faith that you have is how you become un in union with Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, your mind should be going, boom. How did that happen? How is it that God did that? Before the foundations of the world, he chose you. He saw you. He looked down the channels of time and saw that you were going to come to your senses and see him and acknowledge him. Is that how it works? Is that foreknowledge, right? We see this foreknowledge. And we, God looked down the annals of time and he saw us and we saw that we would come to faith in Christ. That's how it works, right? Thank you. <laughs> got, a, got a guy over here I, I, I appreciate. He's reformed. That's good. That's good. No. Turn, turn with me really quickly. I'm gonna jump on John's toes a little bit in Romans. If you can turn with me to Romans chapter nine. We were there a little bit earlier. If that be true then Paul says something in Romans 9 that doesn't match. Paul says something in Romans 9 that doesn't make quite a lot of sense. Start with me in verse 10 of Romans 9. It says, not only this, 
But there was Rebecca also. When she had conceived twins, one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, had they done anything yet? Had God looked down the annals of time and seen that they were going to do something? He said, when they were in the womb. Now, R.C. Sproul says they were womb mates, and that's supposed to be funny, but don't worry about that. While they were still in the womb, while they had not yet done anything, they hadn't done anything, God looks upon them. He says, so that God purpose according to his choice would stand not because of works but because of him who calls it was said to her the older will serve the younger just as it is written Jacob I loved but Esau I hated we won't go into that uh, quote from the Old Testament this morning but just suffice to say that if that be true that God looked down the annals of time and saw us making a choice and coming to him and deriving some ability to do so that would make no sense whatsoever Paul has taken that away from the table. He has taken that out of the way. It's only by God's grace. And that's how we glorify him. We've been talking about how do we give glory to God? How do we bless God? We attribute to him what he has done. And we find this in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it's called Baruch. In the New Testament, it's called eulogy. In the Old Testament, what the, the uh, psalmist did a lot of the times is they would, they would say, God has done this. Turn with me to, um, to Psalms. I'll give you one, one reference here. Psalm 72 verse 18. And basically what the psalmists do, what the Old Testament does in Kings and in Chronicles is it says, here's what God has done and therefore we praise him. Here's what God has done. God saved sinners. God has done this. God has done this. And then we praise him. He, he then, uh, we give him the praise. We give him the glory in that, right? And here you see it just for one sec. This is a Baruch here. It says, blessed be, in verse 18, sorry, 72, 18, Psalm 72, 18 says, blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone works wonders, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. We exist for that. We as the church, those who have faith in Jesus Christ, we live to give glory to God. We live to bless him by attributing to him what he has done. Not what we have done, but what he has done. What I do each day is sinful. What he does is glorious. Amen? You can say, yeah, that's, that's about right. When I sin, when I do something wrong, that's me. When there's something good happening, oh, that's God leading me in that, right? Revealing that to me. He gets the credit when those things are good. So anything bad in the sermon today, attribute to me. Anything good, give glory to God. That would be good. Let's go back. Let's go back to Ephesians. So Paul is using this terminology. He's using this idea of the blessedness of God and that we will enter into a spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And later on in Ephesians 4, he's going to talk about, and in 6, he's going to talk about a spiritual battle. This heavenly realm is another realm. This is another place where there's evil and good, where there's a spiritual battle going on. And so we need to see that we're in Christ. We're on that victory side. In verse 4, let's move on. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Last week I said that in love goes with he predestined us. It's not something you want to build a complete theology on where that in love goes. But that in love is important for us to understand. In love means God put us in a place. God put us in a position. That's a, that's a term there. In love is a term to the relationship we have with God. That's in a reference to those whom he's called and those what he has done for them in the idea of the spiritual heavenly places and the relationship that the father has with the son. The love that the father has for the son is what we're talking about here. The love that the father has displayed upon the son, we're gonna enter into that. We're not the son, right? We don't have what the son has, but we get to enter into the relationship between the father and the son. The, the, the love that they experience, we're gonna enter into. That's the love that Paul is talking about here. And we'll back up just for a second there because he does say, he says that he does something before that love. He says, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. You always got to pay attention to the so that's and the that's and the fours, okay? They're not just there arbitrarily. He says that. Have you ever asked the question, why? That's where the answer comes. When you see so that's and that's and four, the question of the why is being answered for us. That. Why did God do this? Why did God create us? Why did God choose us 
in him before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. That what he started, he's gonna complete. What holiness is, is something inside us. That's the positive. And then the other one, without blame or blameless, is the negative aspect of the same idea that you're gonna be perfect one day. Nobody's perfect now. You guys have a blame. We have sin in our lives. I can prove that to you. I do it all the time. You do it all the time. Never mind. You have a conscience that pricks at you all the time, right? That's an evidence to us. There's an evidence when we feel these things. We go, this is wrong. I don't want to do this. The foundations of the world, he would be holy and blameless. Be holy as he is holy. It's the spirit within us. It's the spirit in us that will make us holy. We are not holy in and of ourselves. God makes us holy. And one day through sanctification, he will see that we're blameless. So there's a positive and a negative way of looking at this. Also another way is to say justification and sanctification. That holiness is what God is doing, that justification. That blamelessness we participate in. I've said this before, there's a sanctification process. We're fighting against sin every single day. Every single day we've gotta see the sin that's in our life and we fight against it. And God gives us the, the means by which to escape it, to confess it, and to repent of it, and to turn to Christ. And we do that each and every day. Hopefully we do that each and every day. Sometimes we need the loving wives that we have. Sometimes we need the loving husbands. Well, not so much husbands, right? I'm gonna, no. We're children, therefore our sanctification process, right? We didn't have children because we needed something or they needed something. Therefore our sanctification, right, kids? Who created everything, kids? God, they, they, they paid attention from last week. Good. I don't have a question for you this week, but I wanted to see if you were paying attention. Thank you. God created all things, so he's sovereign over all things, but blameless before him in love. Turn with me to John 17. Where do I get that in love? Hopefully you're asking the question, where do you derive the understanding of this in love being, the love between the father and son? From the high priestly prayer. I think the high priestly prayer is something you can read through and meditate upon in context with Ephesians chapter one, these, the section that we're in right now. Start with me in verse 22 of John 17. He says, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. This is present tense. He's saying they're experiencing a form of the glory that I had in heaven. The Mount of Transfiguration, the three disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John, saw the transfiguration, saw the glory of God for a moment, just for a moment. But he says, I have given to me, I've given to them that they may be one just as we are one. Wow, he's talking about something future. He's talking about us entering into the, the beauty of the relationship that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have. Think about that. This should be blowing our minds at this point, right? We're gonna enter into this relationship one day and we experience some of it now. Through the gospel, we experience some of that now. Through the gospel, we see into the face of the glory of God. If you guys remember, I talked to you a little bit several months ago about 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses one through seven. That's where we derive that. So if you wanna put that as a note, 2 Corinthians four, one through seven, it talks about that very thing talks about us looking into the face of Christ, into the face of God who's shown in our hearts, shown in our hearts the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we see the gospel, we experience the glory of God in that. Let's continue. Verse 23 in John 17 says, I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Love them as you have loved me. We enter into the love that the Father and the Son have. That the, the love that the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father, we enter into. He says we get to participate in that. Verse 24, for I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. This entire thing happens before the foundations of the world. The love of the Father for the Son, the plan of our being chosen, the plan of us being redeemed, the working of God in the greatness of the gospel before the foundations of the world, that's when it has taken place. That we would be holy and blameless in his sight. In Philippians 1, 6, it says that that which he started in us, he will complete to the day of his return. So we marvel in that, that God will make sure that that is happening. But we need to participate in it. We don't just sit back. 
We have a moral responsibility to these things. We have a moral responsibility to be pursuing Christ, to be pursuing those things. Blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. In the ESV, if you're reading that this morning, it might be gone where it says to himself, but that's very important. They did correct it. I think in 2018, they put it back in. Somehow it got overlooked, but that is vitally important. God is doing this for himself, but he predestined us. Predestined is an unpacking of the choosing of God that he predestined us, that he, before we were even alive, had a place for us. Pre, before, destined, destiny. You get on a plane, you pick out a destiny. You just go to the airport and just kind of throw, by the way, it's a good way to actually take a vacation. You go down and look for tickets. Where's the cheapest place to go in the country? And you go there, right? Because you can get a cheap ticket. That was before COVID, right? Predestination. He predestined us because of his choice for us. He decided ahead of time where our life would lead, where we would end up. We would end up with him. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, that we would come to him, that he would be glorified in all this. Adoption. Anybody here adopted? Anybody here thinking about adopting kids? I haven't adopted any kids yet, so... Tabitha came along and it took away the adoption process. We, go, we got four boys. We need a girl. We really need a girl. At least that's what my wife said. I wasn't really okay with that. I'm like, I'm fine with boys, right? And then we said, we want to adopt two girls from China, right? We want to adopt two Chinese girls from China. Yes, I get two. Well, lo and behold, we get pregnant. I was like, I thought we were done. She goes, apparently not. And I'm starting seminary. And then our son Orion says, I'm getting married. I go, there's two. We're done. No adoption necessary. But, you know, when, you get, when your sons get married, when my sons got married, I got this beautiful, beautiful daughter. I got a daughter. You know, three of my sons are married now, and I, I get these daughters. It's like adoption. I, I didn't get to choose them, though. That was the only, unfortunately, there's no matchmaker, matchmaker, right? But this beautiful relationship I now have with these daughters, they're, they're mine, right? They're part of my family. They're not of the same DNA, but they're part of me. There's this beautiful adoption there, and I call them my daughters, and I love them. I love them like, like my precious Tabitha. But for God, how do we understand this? For God to adopt us, what is the understanding here? Again, let's go to Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter four. Let's look at what he says there about adoption and, and, the, and the proofs of this, right? How many of you go to bed every night saying, I am so assured of my salvation. I need not wander in any way, shape, or form. Well, some of us go to bed going, I just wonder, have I sinned so greatly against God this day? that he would forsake me. No. His mercies renew every morning. His grace to us is abundant. Shall we sin more that his grace may abound? May it never be. Let's take a look at this. I'm in the wrong spot. I lost the bookmarks. Excuse me. I'm looking for my spot. It's in Romans 8. Romans 8, starting in verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit, underline led by the Spirit, for all who are being led by the Spirit. How do we know if we're being led by the Spirit, if the Spirit is working within us and he's leading us? These are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption. We have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. There is the key right there. If you're being led by the Spirit, then you have an intimate relationship with God Almighty. God the Father is your daddy. Now, I'm not saying that blasphemy. There's, there's an intimacy there. Abba Father is an intimacy that we have with God now because the Spirit of God is leading us to say that. We can refer to him as Daddy, Father. I'm dependent upon you. Remember how you were when you were like these little kids? Hey, kids, who's gonna feed you lunch today? Say, Mom and Dad, good answer. Mom and dad are going to feed me today, hopefully, right? Or grandma and grandpa, right? But there's a dependency that we have on mommy and daddy. So the spirit, when the spirit leads us, we see that we can cry out, Abba, Father, I am utterly dependent upon you. And the spirit himself, in verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. We are gonna be glorified with Christ one day. We're gonna sit on the throne with him. 
In Revelation 3.21, it says, those who overcome, they're going to sit on the throne with Christ, on his very throne in heaven. You'll be judging angels in heaven. How many of you are looking forward to judging angels in heaven? I'm not. Must be the fallen angels. We're going to be there sitting with Christ on his throne, enjoying the blessings And Paul is saying you're enjoying some of those blessings right now. You're enjoying the spiritual blessings right now, knowing about that. Right now, knowing that that's your death. For his grace. You're to give him glory for his grace. And you're to cry out, Father, Abba. For the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with God, if indeed we suffer with him. We are here in a a form of suffering. We have to suffer with Christ. The rejections, the ridicule, the things that Christ suffered here on earth, we suffer with him in some way, shape, and form. Not necessarily upon a cross, but we suffer with him. The indignation, the things which came against him, the opposition, the hatred, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him in this life. Turn back again to Ephesians 1. We will suffer with him and we will call upon him and we will be dependent upon him through that adoption. A beautiful picture of God's grace upon us is the picture of adoption. So he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Again, it's through Christ, it's through that, and it's to him that he will receive the glory and the praise for himself. He's done this for himself. He is interested in his glory, in his fame, in his renown, according to the kind intention of his will. Couldn't it have just said according to his will? Remember what I said last week. Paul just keeps putting prepositional phrases on prepositional phrases. Remember, this is one sentence. From 3 to 14 is one sentence with 202 words. You know, if you're in English class, that will get destroyed if you try to pass that by a teacher, right? You've got to chop that into pieces. Paul doesn't do that. He's putting words upon words, paragraph on paragraph, prepositional phrases upon prepositional phrases here. He says, according to the kind intention of his will or his good pleasure of his will, it it is is something that God wants to do in accordance with his kind intention of his will. He wants to make it known. He wants to make his compassion known, his mercy known, his good pleasure. That is according to that, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So I'll stop right there. Look at verse six. Why did he elect us? Why did he choose us? What was the purpose? Is this something we're just going to argue about and say, well, you know, it's all about free will. We have a free will. We sin. We sin. And he overcomes that sin. We do it all the time. But God elected us before we did anything that was good or bad. He elected us. But it was for the praise of his glory. Look at that. To the praise of the glory of his grace. His grace. His elective grace. His gracious choice of us is to be praised. So is election something we're just to say, oh, it's taught in the Bible, that's it? No, look at that. To the praise of the glory of his grace. To the praise. We should be speaking of this with praise. Is it something we should be in contention about? Absolutely not. Something we should praise God for, that he has done this, that he has done the work. Look with me to Romans 11. But isn't there some kind of Grace is not grace if it is not responsive to the performance. Isn't there something I have to do? How many of you think there's something you have to do? Isn't grace responding to what we do? Turn with me to Romans 11. Let's turn back there. Romans 11 again. And by the way, when you're reading through Romans, one of the things I would say you should keep in mind, and it has helped me in the past as I've read through the book of Romans, it is immense in its theology and lineage as it lines things out. But one of the things that is here in the book of Romans is there's a skeptic. Paul is talking to a skeptic. It's probably himself. He's arguing in the book of Romans, it can't be, it can't be, it can't be. From a human standpoint, he's arguing for these things. He's arguing against himself and he's answering those objections as he goes through the book of Romans. But look with me at Romans 11, starting in verse 4. But what is the divine response to him? He's talking about Elijah, 
who Elijah basically thought he was the only one out there. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to the knee of Baal. In the same way, they there has, oh, oh sorry, in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Gracious choice. It's a gracious demonstration of God. He saved a remnant. He saved a people for himself. But, in verse 6, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Grace is nullified if it's about our works. If there's something that we think it has to be a response to our performance, if there's something that we think that we have to do to appease God, it's no longer grace. It's no longer praiseworthy. It's no longer something that God receives glory for if we say we must do something. Okay, how many of you are gonna go out and sin it up today? You know, Jan's like, what are you talking about? We don't do that, right? We know that there is a moral responsibility. So think about this for a second. There's God's sovereign ability and there's our moral responsibility. Are those in contention? No. We have a responsibility before God to obey him. And that's not in contention to his sovereign ability that he's given to us. These are not in contention. They're parallel tracks. And if you're a believer here today, you obey God to bring him glory. You obey him that he would be receiving the glory, that you would be being holy and blameless. You're pursuing the blamelessness. To do what? To give God the glory. God's gracious choice, a remnant was there. Verse seven. Verse seven of Romans 11 again, it says, what then? What, what Israel is seeking is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it and the rest were hardened. And the rest were hardened. Some obtained it. God's gracious choice of us. Is there more grace given to those who are humble? Yeah, James 4 says that more grace is given to those who are humble. If you're humble, he'll give you grace. He gives grace to the humble. He opposes who? The proud. God is trying to take away our pride every single day. God is trying to take away from us. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying that in a good way. Okay, don't think I'm, I'm saying God is trying to take something away from you that you need. He's trying to strip us of our pride. He's trying to strip us of our self-sufficiency. He's trying to strip us and show us every single day that we need him. Every single day. And the older you get, the more you understand that, right? Mark's not here. I can't use him as an example, sorry. Mark's been given God's grace. He's walking around right now because his back is hurting him. I can almost guarantee you. By God's grace, though, he's getting better. What level will that take? We don't know. But God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. So we want to see that we follow that in obedience. The blamelessness is that we put away our pride. Our blamelessness is that we pursue humility before God. Blamelessness means that we give credit to God. Blessing God means we attribute to him the things which he has done. Blessing God means we say, God saved sinners like me. God saves sinners like me. When you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, when you repented of your sins and you came to him as the only means of your salvation, he was glorified and he did it. He gave you the ability to come to him. He gave you the ability to choose to come to him. Sorry, I don't want to say choose. He gave you the ability to recognize what he had done to the praise of the glory of his grace in verse six, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, in the beloved, in Christ, in him, in whom. 11 times in these 202 words, 11 times he makes reference to the union with Christ, either in Christ, in the beloved, or in whom. How many times does Paul have to tell us this very thing that it's because of our union with Christ that we're experiencing these blessings? God put us in union with his son so we could experience the love of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ, that we would one day step into heaven, one day step into the beautiful relationship between the, the love of the father and the son. But we experience it in measure now. We still experience it in measure now because of the gospel, because of the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. We look back upon the cross and we should be going, wow, look what God has done. Give him the credit. He gets the glory. He did it. He saved a sinner like me and you. 
and he freely bestowed on us in the beloved this grace. God be glorified in that. Amazing. God be glorified in that. And did he choose the noble things of the world? What did he choose? How did he go about doing this choice? What were the conditions? Wouldn't you like to know that? It's like when you're out evangelizing, everybody goes out evangelizing on Saturdays, right? To the plaza. I used to do that. I prayed to a lot of people praying for us. What are you looking for? It's like we're out there on the plaza. It's like, well, I wonder if that, who, who, who do we look for? Who do you look for to present the gospel to? Who is it? How, do we, how did God choose these things? Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter one. We would never consider these things that God considered, that God says. In verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter one, we read this. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. We have nothing to boast about in our salvation. Zero, nothing. We are not to boast. He's taking that away. You do not boast in anything before God. You will get no credit for the works you've done unless they're done in Christ, unless they're the works that he has given us to do. It says there is no boasting before God. Look at verse 30. But by his doing, you are in Christ. That makes it really clear for us. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's pretty simple and straightforward, I think. Very straightforward. We boast in Christ because he did it. He saved us. He leads us. We cry, Abba, Father, because of the spirit within us, that's the spirit of adoption. We cry out to the Father, Abba, Father. I didn't do that. When somebody came and kicked down my door when I was 20 years old and presented the gospel to me, I had my first son in the, in the bedroom and all I wanted was a BMW and a cell phone. Excuse me if you own a BMW or a cell phone, it's not sinful. I only wanted the things of the world. All my desire was for the things of the world. That's it. I didn't see beyond my two eyeballs. I couldn't see anything above the horizon. All I wanted was what this earth had to give me. That's it. I didn't want anything more. And I want as much of it as I could possibly get. And then this man said, guess what? You need a, in, in retrospect, he says, you need a savior. No, I don't. Yes, you do. You can't save yourself. And if you stand before God, you will be incinerated. I'm paraphrasing what he said. It was a long dissertation. But he asked me at the end, he says, does this make sense? I went, yeah, what you just basically told me. I'm a sinner and he used the Romans road and he presented to me my sin and my accountability before God, all sin. What's the wages of sin? Death. I knew what wages were all about. I work three jobs all the time. Wages of sin is death. What are you gonna do about that? I don't know. I need a savior. Can you put your faith in him? At the moment, when I realized that God had me, caused me to be born again. The adoption and being born again are just two different sides of the same coin. When it says in John 1, you gotta be born again. When he's talking to Nicodemus in John chapter three, and he says, you've got to be born again. The spirit's gotta do that. It's the same as adoption. That We come to adoption. He's using two beautiful sides of a dynamic coin that God is doing that and that you need that. So the plea is this morning, the plea is that you would come to Christ. If you haven't come to Christ, that you would come to Christ, that you would recognize that you're sinful, that your sin will be death, that the wages of sin is death. But, don't you love the word but in the Bible? But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wait, you just preached a whole sermon on the fact that God has to do it. Absolutely. And if he's doing it, you need to be responsible and come to him. There are two parallel tracks. You've got to come to Jesus Christ to be saved, but you can't do it unless he draws you. Read through John chapter six. I'm out of time. John chapter six, he says, unless the father draws you, you can't come to me. The word for draw there is like taking a bucket and throwing it down in a well and lifting up water. Unless the father draws you and puts you in the son's hand, it ain't gonna happen. But I appeal to you right now, come to Jesus Christ. 
Little kids that aren't paying attention. <gasps> gotcha. Ha What do you need to do? You need to come to Christ. You need to put your faith in Christ. You need to say that I can't save myself. I can do nothing on my own. God's got to do it for me. And it's through his son. And I put my faith in him that he can do it. I trust in him for everything. And you realize what God has done. And then your boast is in him. Your boast is in the Lord. Back to Ephesians. Forgot I have a few more things. Moral responsibility. Look at chapter 4. Verse 29, it says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as, in, as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the, the Holy Spirit of God. That's for those who are in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Wow, there's 41 imperatives, roughly, in the book of Ephesians. 41 places where... We are morally responsible. There's a moral agency throughout the book of Ephesians that we need to respond, that we need to be obedient, that we need to do something. And if we don't, we grieve the Holy Spirit. We grieve the counsel of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is giving us counsel on how to live our life blameless and holy. And how do we do that? We take his counsel. We do not grieve him. We follow the commands of God. And look down also in verse five. It says, for this in chapter five, 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 For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. He will talk about the sons of disobedience in chapter 2. They were dead in our sins and trespasses and our sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Radical corruption. Paul will get to radical corruption after he lines out election in this first chapter. But that's our condition. We are radically corrupt and we need a savior. We cannot see the glory of God until God does it, until God's initiative does it. We do not initiate it, God does it. And we're held accountable to those things. We have a responsibility before God to do that. Will we give him praise for this? Because of the adoption, because of us being in Christ, will we give him the praise? Verse six, end there please with verse six. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Please think on that today and always. Who has put you in Christ? In the letter to the Corinthians, he made it very clear. God did it. God put you in Christ. You didn't open up your life to him. You didn't accept him and say, I'm putting down my barriers. He broke down the walls just like that big Texan did in my front door. He busted down my door, turned off my TV, and presented the gospel to me. He didn't really do that. He actually knocked, and I opened the door. But he knew how to turn off my TV, which was kind of weird, and kind of rude, too. I'm like, what's this guy doing turn off my TV? You think I'm thankful for that man? Absolutely. He's still alive. He's still kicking. I don't know how many years he's got left, but I thank God for sending that man to my house to open my eyes to the truth of the gospel. Oh, that we would enjoy that too. To the praise of his glory, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's what we're to live for. Take, chap- take verse six, underline it and say, how am I giving praise, the praise of the glory of his grace? How am I praising God's glorious grace? How am I doing that? How am I doing that? Let's pray.